Great. So hello, everyone. This is quite a, a big group. Happy that so many people could participate tonight. Um, I'm John Alert. I uh, co-chair the Business Advisory Council and I'm chair of the New York City chapter. I'm very happy to be with everybody tonight. Um, like many things are post-COVID lives, the logistics of this annual event have changed, uh, but not the focus. You know, it's a, a timely topic to top in the insights from some of our brightest, uh, most successful and, and truly dedicated alumni. So I want to thank all of you for volunteering your time and participating tonight. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, tonight's topics clearly continue that tradition and we're lucky to have Bob Boyd graciously step up to moderate. He's a, he's a, a proven resource in this category. I think he's going for the all time lead on moderating uh, alumni panels. Um, but with that, you know, I'm, I'm really happy where we could make it further. Uh, those of you that can, we'd love to see your oh. faces if you want to turn on your cameras. Um, if you're uh, in the middle of something, we totally understand. We're still very happy to have you with us. But, you know, the topic tonight, the workplace of today and tomorrow, even just in the early conversations, how, how much everybody's life has changed and kind of where that's going um, is just continues to be exceptionally relevant. So uh, I'm looking forward to tonight. I'm looking forward to people participating. Um, and as always, you know, uh, we're always interested in your feedback as well. So with that, I am going to kick it over to Bob and uh, get this thing rolling. Absolutely. Thanks again, Thank everybody. You. Thanks, John. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody tonight. Uh, one, if you could, as, as John mentioned, turn on your cameras because the audience, the, the panel is looking out right now at all these boxes. So if you could just turn on your camera, we'd appreciate it. Um, that would be great. Uh, the other thing is this session is being recorded for prior, for subsequent playback. So please be advised of that. Uh, if you haven't put the year of your graduation or your anticipated graduation next to your name, uh, please do that uh, now so that we have a sense of who's here. Uh, before we get started, the views expressed by myself and the panelists don't represent the views of the State University of New York College at Geneseo, nor do they necessarily represent the views of the speakers organization, and they represent our personal views. So with that, I'd like to kick off the panel, and, and we're just going to, we want to make, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, we'll try to engage. We want it to be an interactive discussion. Um, so we're going to start, and why don't, why don't we start, Mike, with you, and uh, what's your, uh, your graduation, what, what, what do you do today, what's your current work environment like, uh, just to get us started, just to what kind of panelists we have. Yeah, hi, Bob, hi, everybody. Uh, yes, uh, I graduated in uh, 1984, um, May of 84. In June of 84, I joined a local company developer called Wilmerite, uh, a, a developer of shopping centers and other commercial projects. And uh, here I am, uh, 37 years later, I, I am still working for Wilmerite. Uh, during that time, from 84 to about 93, I managed and, and oversaw the marketing programs for, uh, I think, four or five of our properties. In 1993, I came back here to Rochester uh, to manage uh, Eastview Mall. That was just, uh, you know, Eastview had opened back in, uh, in 1971, but they were undergoing a, uh, a plans for a major expansion in 1995. So I came back in 93 and... Um, oversaw that expansion and subsequent expansions in 2003 and 2013. And uh, I've been here ever since. Uh, interestingly, I, I, I started with the right, right around the time that uh, QVC was gonna be uh, causing the, the death of the mall. And uh, fortunately, I'm still here all these years later. So- uh, How's your work it's environment changed, Mike? Uh, has a, uh, you know, um, not a lot, obviously during the pandemic, you know, the, the mall was closed. Um, and uh, things were changed significantly at that, that period in time. Uh, however, the, uh, the office really, it's a small office I work in. We have a total of six of us here in the office. Uh, we have pretty much been working straight through. Uh, we've been seen as, a, we're seen as essential employees at the time. Uh, we reopened the mall. We closed in uh, mid-March of last year, reopened in July. Um, and, uh, and again, not, not all that much has changed. Um, you know, uh, business uh, continues. We obviously we lost some occupancy during that period of time, but uh, we've been very fortunate in the fact that uh, business has returned and it's returned really strong. So 
there's been some good things that have happened this year amongst, uh, you know, some of the turmoil. Sure. Denise, did you know Mike when he was in Geneseo? No, we really didn't know each other. Isn't that ironic? We did not. Same year graduation. Okay. okay, so as long as we got you talking, Denise. So I graduated with an English education degree, did teach for a few years, um, stayed home with my children because they were born one right after the other. And when it was time for me to re-enter the workforce, that's when corporate training was becoming an actual career path. So first I went into training. Um, then I went and spent a couple of years in marketing and communications so I could um, enhance my writing and communication skills. And then I moved back into training as a leader then I moved into the world of diversity and inclusion. And after four and a half years as the global chief diversity officer at Autos Corporation, I just started a job with Microsoft in their accessibility and accommodation space as it appeal, appears to, well, applies to both learners internally and externally. So, so you got a new job in the middle yeah. of this? How, how did yeah. you uh, find a new job? I mean, how did that happen in the middle of this? COVID thing. Um, actually, they approached me um, because I had worked closely with their accessibility partners group as part of my role as the global chief diversity officer. And I had no intention of changing careers at this point in my life. I'm 59 years old. But, you know, this was an opportunity that I thought, well, I can sit here and I love what I do. Or I could try something completely different that will have a profound impact on the way that people with disabilities are um, able to access training materials and development materials. And I thought, this is where I need to turn my attention. And so I went for it. And I'll tell you, I was worried, worried sick about making this kind of risk at this time. Um, but uh, so far, it's been worth it. <laughs> and now, did you have to move? No. No, I've worked from home for 12 years. And, you know, that's definitely going to become more of a way forward for people. And if not a hybrid approach where they might go into the office a couple of days a week, um, but also a real opportunity for full time work from home without any real questions asked about it. Um, you know, the pandemic has taught companies a lot about the fact that they can trust people who work from home. There isn't, you know, bonbon eating and trips to Mike's Mall in the middle of the day and things along those lines. People really do work and they actually statistically work more hours and produce higher level of results. That's interesting. How does that work across the, you know, your previous role was in diversity. How does the remote and hybrid working impact diversity? I mean, does it discriminate away by being that against one group or another? Actually, it's been really good for people with disabilities because some of them are mobility limited and working in an office setting could pose, you know, some um, transportation issues, some issues of being able to get to work in a reasonable time and not require a great deal of time, you know, away for other portions of their services that they need. And people with disabilities have really been able to find higher levels of, of employment since the pandemic started. It also was really great for um, students who, because of the pandemic, took a look at their collegiate um, scheduling and, and trajectory and decided to go to school part-time, work part-time. So students have a greater availability to work now because they can kind of fit it around their school schedules. And then it's also great for working parents because of the fact that there is more flexibility for them to be able to handle the schedule the pandemic has imposed on them. So you'll see that um, parents are now expecting there to be at least a hybrid solution, if not a full-time work from home option. And you'll also note that the younger generations are looking for that as well as the people in my age bracket. So it's gonna be a real interesting next three to four years as people continue to look at this. And now that it's worked and it's worked well, people would like it to stay. Yeah, absolutely. Ed. Let me just get myself unmuted there, Bob. Uh, first of all, Denise, I'm coming for you because uh, we need we need some uh, to, to line up some speakers to come on campus. Um, 
Sure, I'd love to. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, Ed Moore. I graduated in uh, way back in 1986, before many of our viewers probably were even a twinkle in their parents' eyes, as they say. Um, and uh, I, I've worked in the food industry for quite a while. I moved back to uh, Western New York um, to join Rich Products about eight years ago. I got reconnected with Geneseo and have been uh, really happy to do that. So I'm on the, the Western New York um, Business Advisory Council chapter. And uh, earlier this year, um, Dean Zuckerman asked me to, to chair a new group called uh, Positive Societal Impact Committee. So uh, our group is, uh, is very uh, interested and actively involved in um, issues related to diversity, inclusion, community outreach, and so forth. Um, I split time between Buffalo, uh, where Rich Products is headquartered and where I um, uh, uh, work primarily, uh, and uh, a home on Cuca Lake in the Finger Lakes. For those of you who know the, the Finger Lakes region, just a, a real pretty place. Um, Bob, you asked about our current environment. Uh, Rich Products is a, is a global company. We have about 12,000 people around the world. Um, many, many of them are in manufacturing um, as a food company, which Rich Products is. Um, we were deemed uh, an essential business. So uh, associates who are affiliated with the production of our products continued to go to work throughout this entire pandemic, um, which you know we owe just a huge debt of gratitude to. Uh, for those who had office jobs, um, we sent them home on March 13th of 2020. And uh, we're having a heck of a time getting any of them to come back to the office because um, it's, it's worked well. We were well positioned with our technology and with our, uh, our, our uh, principles around flexible work. We refer to um, our, our, our uh, workplace as um, the world as our workplace. Mm -hmm. um, our chairman is famous, uh, has famously said the sun never sets on rich products. Um, you know, largely because we have people who are in all corners of the world. Um, I think uh, people have become extremely uh, capable and competent with, uh, with technology like this Zoom. We happen to use uh, a Microsoft product called Teams. Um, but I also think, you know, a couple points that Denise raised are really, really critical. Um, and and we're, we're trying to, to find good ways to address um, related to fatigue. Um, you know, I think people always had the ability to commiserate, if you will, with coworkers, take a break, recharge, and now they just go from one virtual meeting to another virtual meeting. So we did reopen our offices for any associate who is vaccinated uh, after Labor Day of this year. Um, we're still seeing only about 10 to 15 percent of our people actually go to the office. And I think it's largely because they feel productive at home. They have concerns still about the time that we announced our, uh, our, our uh, loosening up what we called a phase one return. The Delta variant popped back up. Um, people were unsure about you know, what, what school was gonna look like for small children. So you know, we've, um, we've demonstrated lots of flexibility. Um, a famous expression that we, saw, we heard early in the pandemic and have repeated often is, you know, we're, we're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. So we've really tried to meet each person where they are and, and kind of address their needs with that, that flexibility. Okay. What were some of the challenges around the uh, production force getting them back to work? Well, you know, they never stopped going to work, um, but we had to put in um, a lot of safety protocols right from the very beginning. So uh, we did a lot of uh, screening up front. They had to wear, you know, so-called um, PPE, personal protective equipment. So people were, uh, and, and still to this day, continuing to work in face masks and those who are not vaccinated. We also required them to wear face shields. They work in large manufacturing uh, sites, which uh, are often loud and it's difficult enough to hear people. But when you can't see their lips moving, it, it becomes even more difficult. We have a lot of people who live in multi-generational homes. And while we were keeping people safe and protected in our own workplace, we really had little control over, you know, their living situations as well. So, um, you know, across 12,000 or so associates, I think the latest number I saw was 
maybe somewhere around 2,600 of our associates have contracted COVID. Um, Whoa, that's a lot. This period of time, it's a big number. We've we've had 17 fatalities um, due to COVID, um, which you know one would be too many. Um, and I think uh, you know the vast majority of those are people that you know did not have the I'll call it the luxury of you know working from home and kind of shrinking their bubble and and staying in that that safe uh, that safe area. How did you feel when you had that many people getting COVID and people dying? How, how did you, how did you feel? It's heartbreaking, you know, and uh, and I have to say that um, despite the facts, you know, sometimes people just don't don't believe it. They don't think it's you know, um, and we I don't want to make it a, as a, a political kind of a statement, but you know, people who have uh, said that it's it's a hoax or it's made up, I can tell you. You know, I have the names of all 2,600 people who have gotten sick. We know where they got sick. We know how they got sick. Um, the 17 people who have who have passed away um, all had underlying health conditions. You know, all the things that we hear in the media, all the warnings um, that uh, you know that have been communicated. We've tried to do the same, and uh, you know, despite all those efforts, sometimes it's just not enough. So, safety is is number one for us. Um, uh, associate safety, food safety, you know, it's extended to health and protecting people as best we can. So it's really hard. It's been really taxing on our, uh, on our manufacturing uh, folks. And, you know, we'll probably talk about other challenges as we go, but you know, mm -hmm. I've got roughly 500 or so open jobs today. Um, and, uh, you know, as we 500, 500 across, let's say 28. That's 5% that's of your workforce. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big number. And, uh, you know, it, it causes us to not be able to um, provide all that our customers are willing to buy from us. And so you're turning business away because you don't have enough workers. We are indeed. Yeah. It takes, wow. uh, it, it, yeah. It starts to get, you know, very real when that happens. Wow. So, okay. Tom. Hello, everyone. My name is Tom Condon. I'm a tax partner with KPMG based in Manhattan I graduated in 1997, which really for me feels like just the other day, but uh, I realize it really isn't. I started with KPMG right out of school, and uh, I will tell you, I never really thought that I was going to be an accountant. I thought I would test it out, get my CPA, and then kind of figure out what, what my uh, great calling was going to be. And what, what I found out was that actually was my calling, and I really enjoy it. I've had a host of different roles within the firm. I've grown from an associate to now um, um, the, the partner leading operations for our mobility practice. And uh, during that time, I got a chance to even have an international assignment in Brussels, which was a great experience. In terms of the, the work environment, um, KPMG's offices are open, albeit at a reduced capacity, but, but the default position is still that, you know, the vast majority of our folks are working from home. Um, it's funny, similar to kind of the point that Ed had made, the number one priority for the firm is, you know, health and well-being of, of our people. Um, but we are seeing more folks opting into coming back to the office and having that interpersonal communication, that interpersonal contact, because what we're hearing is a lot of folks are just tired of the Zoom meetings, tired of the MS Teams meetings, so they're just exhausted. And the other thing that, that Ed had pointed out is the well-being of folks. People have been working really hard, and yes, they've been very productive, but what used to happen when you were in the office was you'd, you'd have things scheduled during the day, but you'd get up, you'd walk around, you'd interact with people. What's happening now is every 30 minute block is being packed with another call, one after the other, after the other. And, and we've seen people really having a tough time with that. And we took a couple of approaches to try to make it a little bit easier. So one of the things is we created No Camera Friday, where no one would be on Camera Friday. You would still have the conference calls and doing a lot of the things you were doing albeit without the, the added uh, piece of the, the video conference. Um, heads down Wednesdays. So Wednesday afternoon from two o'clock to the end of the day is blocked everyone's calendar. And the expectation is that unless it's an emergency, that's a chance for people to catch up on different things that have occurred during the week. Um, and then the other thing we've done is we've shortened the, the meetings from an hour to 50 minutes. And it was, you know, so it's automatically the way that the calendars are working. So that was giving people that little bit of a break when you were going from call to call, just to try to give people an opportunity to stretch their legs, get a get a you know, cup of coffee or a glass of water or something along those lines. Okay. So things that we're trying to do to, to make it a bit more bearable, but we are seeing folks 
going back to the office. So uh, we're waiting to see what that really means in, in the coming months and years. Great. Michaela. Hey, everybody. I'm Michaela Gaskin. I'm the president and CEO of KJT. Um, we're a healthcare research and consulting firm, actually based in Rochester. And I graduated in 06, um, found my way into market research very quickly. Um, just some experience at the Geneseo Survey Research Center and, you know, networking connections. And um, 14 years ago now, I joined this uh, small startup, KJT, and um, I'm, you know, uh, leading the company. So um, things have been very different for, for some of our employees. I will say pre-COVID, we had about 10 to 12 employees who worked for us 100% remote. And what that mean was we had to have all the technology and infrastructure ready, you know, ready for them to fully activate with our organization. So when things, you know, went sideways in March of 2020, we all went home and, um, you know, just kind of signed online the next Monday. And, you know, we were fully remote from March until August of last year. And then we've been hybrid in the Rochester office um, since, you know, last August, but three days in the office or the office being open three days and from home two days every single week. Um, we have continued that um, until actually next week where our office is gonna be open again five days a week. Um, but this time with the expectation that folks will come in two to three days, at least two to three days a week, um, but they get to pick which days they're coming into the office. Um, so one of, the, one of the major things that's changed for us has been our mix of workers. So before COVID, we had about uh, 45, maybe 47 employees. And as I said, only about a dozen of those were outside of the Rochester area. We actually tipped the scales over the summer, given the growth that we've been going through in the last 18 months. Um, we now have 67 employees and only 25 or 27 of them are in the Rochester area. So we now have many, many more 100% um, remote employees um, than we actually have in that hybrid stance, so. Great. Uh, now I got a couple of questions and we can just uh, jump, anybody can feel free to jump right in. Um, how do you build teamwork in this hybrid or remote environment? I'll jump in for you, Bob. Um, so I think it's, you have to be very intentional about it. We have really, you know, leveled up our commitment to our committees. So we have a wellness committee, we have a social committee, we have other committees throughout the organization. And during COVID, we've really requested that they step up and elevate what they're offering truly. Um, so whether it's remote Tai Chi or, you know, beer yoga or, you know, meditative sessions um, where you can have, you know, mindfulness practice and, and learn to meditate um, and kind of control some of your anxiety, perhaps, you know, we've really asked them to step up in a lot of different ways, offer opportunities um, internally. And that's a really great way for folks to um, build teamwork and, and team connections um, through those avenues. We've also, um, since COVID started, um, we instituted happy hours every other every other Thursday. So I actually just came off of one this afternoon. We're still going strong. Um, it's an opportunity for folks to connect um, remotely with everybody. And, um, you know, the, the list goes on. There's, you know, we now have people who do remote puzzles together and, you know, other online games and quizzes. And um, you just have to really think creatively about how to engage, but also to make time um, for those necessary activities um, between Monday to Friday. Huh? It's funny, Mich Michaela used a perfect word and it's intentional. And, and I think in addition to being intentional, it's scheduled as well. And a lot of times that that collaboration, that teamwork wasn't necessarily scheduled as much as it was kind of organic to some degree. But now we are being intentional to her point, but also scheduled to make sure that these things are occurring and ensuring that we're freeing up time for people to do just that. We're explicitly blocking time for people to be able to collaborate and, and work as a team. You know, in like August of 2020, I started this program that I call Talking in Circles. And it's an opportunity for people to come together and talk about the isms, racism, ableism, sexism, et cetera. And I use a video, um, maybe it's an article from the web, it could be a poster. 
Um, Cole Hahn, which is mainly a manufacturer of shoes, did this wonderful poster campaign about equity and fairness and respect. So we use those posters. Um, Mattel does a whole series of vlogs using the Barbie character um, as a spokesperson for um, social justice. It's aimed at the tweens audience. And so when we did a couple of those videos, we asked our, our employees, well, to watch those videos with their kids and then talk about what their kids were saying in reaction to them. One was about what they call microaggressions, which is, you know, when a person from a marginalized situation is often um, discriminated against through comments that are made that are supposed to be a joke or what have you and are definitely demeaning comments. Um, that program actually won an external award through an organization called Inspiring Workplaces and an internal award through our HR department and has spawned a great deal of discussion of a better understanding of each other's lived experiences and provided that vehicle for people to connect and something other than specifically just related to work itself, but to these social justice issues, these diversity and equity issues. And it really was really terrific. And one of the videos, the first one we did, which I recommend anybody watches, and I'll put the title into the chat window. It's called Two Strangers Who Meet Five Times. Um, it's really powerful and it's a great team discussion point. Um, it's also great to watch with your kids and really just talk about how you react to this particular video. Mm -hmm. now, talking about that, have you, in this uh, virtual world that we're working, so many of us, are you seeing more microaggressions um, or less, do you think? It depends on the situation. I think what's happening now is because there's a greater awareness of microaggressions and into when intersectionality comes into play. Now you're seeing more people calling it out, which is exactly what we should be seeing. You know, people are not um, tolerating it and they are speaking up. You know, the Me Too movement really started a lot of that um, a couple of years back now, but it really is important to, to have an employee base that feels empowered, that feels they can speak up. And you have to set the stage through a lot of open communication and reinforcement of your core values and the, you know, the ramifications if people are not adhering to a zero discrimination um, tolerance level and so forth. So it's, it's an interesting time to be in this kind of work because there is a lot of change and positive change, but there's a long way to go too. Now, Bob, if, if, if I can jump in, Mike, I'm going to jump in before you because there won't be anything left for us to say on this particular topic. Um, sure. You know, I think um, uh, as it, your first question around um, teamwork, you know, I, I would say, you know, Rich is too. We've done a lot of the, the things that, that people have called out. Um, one of the things we were very, very concerned about was how we hold our culture together. Ah, yes. Uh, Rich is very, you know, a, a, a very strong uh, family-oriented culture. And our concern was, hey, once once people go off to their individual homes, are we going to be able to hold it together? It was a real, really a good challenge for our senior leadership team to increase the amount of communication that we did. So you know, our associates have now said, um, you know, they, they know where we stand on issues. Our transparency has been terrific. You know, I remind all of us that uh, shortly after the pandemic began and um, we began to see some, you know, economic devastation that probably hadn't, uh, we hadn't seen since, you know, the Great Depression. Um, and then on top of that, the social unrest um, culminating in the death of George Floyd, there was a lot of unrest. And um, this was probably true of other organizations as well as Rich's but our associates didn't really know where to turn. And, uh, and what we found was that they trusted our leadership. They trusted uh, our CEO and, and the people that we brought in to talk about what's going on with the pandemic, to talk about you know, our position and reinforce our, um, our values related to microaggressions, discrimination, and, and uh, 
in the, the difficulties um, related to a lot of the social unrest. We've found that, that this technology um, somewhat has democratized participation in, in ways that we really didn't expect. Uh, so every one of us has the same size box. Um, there isn't, you know, Bob, you're not at the very top of the screen here is the, the leader moderator here. We're all sort of on this together. Um, that's good. That, I, that, that's yeah, good. I, I mean, absolutely. It's, it's had that effect, still lots and lots of work to do. And I think as, you know, people have had, I think, more meaningful conversations about these kinds of topics because they've been at home and they've had more opportunity to really think about what they think as opposed to, you know, necessarily jumping in right away with, uh, with what others think. So I, I also was just going to point out one, uh, one small thing I haven't heard others describe. Um, we, we started a, uh, uh, a, a weekly uh, program for, for lack of a better word, tell me something good. We invited our associates to share good news, things that they saw other associates doing, things that people were doing for customers or helping out somebody in the community. And we weren't sure how long it would go. Um, you know, I think we're 70 plus episodes in, we're doing two a week for a while. And the guy that's running it for us said, please say, you know, I need, I, I have another job. I can't, I can't be producing this all the time, but every week, you know, we produce a eight to 10 minute um, talk show, you know, kind of video um, series that just celebrates good things that are happening in, you know, in a time when I think people are really looking for that. Oh, that's great. Hey, Bob. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I think we're a little bit of the ad man out here because, um, you know, our job here really is operations related and, uh, you know, a maintenance person or, or a, a security officer can't work from home. Uh, there are people that need to be on site and uh, have, have needed to be on site, you know, really all the way through the, uh, the pandemic. Um, our challenge, uh, you know, last year, 2020, was not a good year in our industry. Uh, so we were working with uh, budgets that, uh, that were reduced significantly going into 2021. So I think our big challenge is, uh, has to do with asking people to do more uh, than they had done in the past, uh, you know, doing more with less. And, uh, you know, we've had to show appreciation, um, maybe not necessarily entirely with pay, but, but uh, you know, a few more thank yous and, you know, pizzas for lunch or, or, you know, donuts in the morning or whatever it may be, just as a way to kind of show our appreciation for that work that the people are doing, um, because they know that, uh, you know, our staff of 60, you know, drops down to, you know, 45 or 50. And uh, they're being asked to do more um, with less. So that, that's probably been our biggest challenge um, because all of our people basically have been working on site through it all. What's going on with uh, recruiting and hiring? How has that changed? Uh, Michaela, you, you've hired how many more new people? We've hired a ton of people this year. I think we've actually made 23 hires this year because we did lose a couple of folks. Um, it's been nothing short of insane. Um, I don't know how else to characterize it. Um, you know, we, we're in a very niche industry, right? But so folks with different social science backgrounds or business backgrounds, marketing, you name it, you know, we can pull from a lot of different areas, but um, working specifically in the healthcare and life sciences sector, the kind of experience that we're looking for is pretty niche. So um, we actually have, even for the positions that we, we have open now, we have three different external recruiters who are engaged um, to try and recruit talent for us right now. They've been, you know, the full spectrum of, you know, helpful and actually have recruited somebody for us and others have done nothing. Um, so that's super interesting. And all they keep telling us is the market's unprecedented. Um, it's such an employee-driven market right now. Like, you know, you're going to have to consider paying more, potentially signing bonuses, like you name it. It's, it's working right now um, in the employee's favor. We've been um, incredibly successful with our in-house HR director. Um, we've made some strong connections with some academic programs. So pulling, you know, students out of master's programs, that's been really beneficial. Um, and also just, you know, doing the hard work in Indeed and LinkedIn to try and, you know, find the right candidates for us. 
and then taking them through um, our our rigorous interview process. So it's okay. it's been wild. Why did you have to hire so many people? Uh, we've been growing that much. We grew sixty percent year over year. So wow. yeah. Something, Tom. What about you? I mean, you're in a business that goes through people. We do hire quite a lot. So it's funny, we've always had the experienced hires. And then, of course, we have uh, university talent that we bring in. So uh, lots of Geneseo students have come through my practice. And uh, many are still there. Many are, have become partners, which we're proud of. One of the things that, that I would say for us is the the experienced hire recruiting really hasn't changed all that much because there was always that one-to-one -one interaction. Now, of course, it's remote um, as opposed to in person. What's changed profoundly for us, and, and not forever, but temporarily, has really been the approach of going to campuses and interacting with students. We would always have a chance to come out, put on, for lack of a better term, a dog and pony show to really make sure that the students understood what we did and how we did it to give them a feel for whether or not that was something that would be appealing to them. We got to meet face to face. We got to share a meal with them. We got to spend time together. And now, because of the, the pandemic, because of obviously health concerns, we, we've moved to currently a, a virtual platform. And it's very different. The ability to connect, the ability to have very successful group meetings is really not the same. People are, you know, meeting doubt. They're, they're tired of having Zoom meetings. They're tired of having these things. So being able to really share with the students, hey, this is who we are. This is what we do. doesn't really resonate the way it used to. So we're working through it as best we can right now. But we are excited to say that we, we are of the belief we'll be back on campuses this spring, which is something that that's always been near and dear to my heart. So it'll be nice to get back to that. And hopefully we can come down and visit you again. Uh, we sure hope so. As soon as you're ready, we're ready. Okay. How, are you having a hard time finding people? So it's interesting. Um, campus recruiting is more competitive than it's ever been. So congratulations to everybody on campus right now. When, when I graduated in 97, I would say probably 20, 30% of us had jobs getting out of uh, college. I'm of the belief that the vast majority of you will have opportunities to be employed before you've graduated. So it's definitely um, uh, a, an employee or a, a candidate market. And, and I think the opportunities are there. So while this isn't a, uh, a conversation about getting a job, I would tell everyone, please make sure your resume is wonderful. Make sure you're covered letter is perfect. Make sure you are availing yourself of all the wonderful opportunities Geneseo is providing to you in terms of career counseling and get out there. Look for, for the job that's going to make you happy. I just want to piggyback on one thing Tom said. A cover letter, I don't know what career services are out there, and I'm not saying this is Geneseo, but I have seen so many applicants apply for jobs this year that did not include a cover letter. And it, it might, be, might be just me being old school, but it counts and it shows you care and that you actually read the job description. So do it. Okay, good. Mike, it definitely about, gives you an advantage. Okay, so you've had success hiring, and uh, Mike, how? What about the hiring process, and what's out there for you and the um, businesses that are in the mall? Yeah, yeah, the retailers have have really struggled this year uh, finding help. I mean, you know, I had mentioned you know, twenty twenty was a tough year. Well, twenty twenty one has been an outstanding year for sales. Um, you know, the mall is running. You know, about ten eleven percent. Uh, over where we were in 2019, we kind of cross out 2020 as kind of a, a you know a non-issue. Um, so we have really growing sales. Um, our occupancy is starting to build back up, but our stores cannot find help. Um, they have you know they've increased their hourly wage. It's still certainly on what would be you know considered the lower end, uh, but uh, but it's been a struggle. I mean there there are literally hundreds of 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 jobs, both part-time and full-time uh, here at the mall, in the mall stores. Um, and heading into the holiday season, that, that number is probably gonna double. I, I bet you we'll have, uh, if I had to guess, you know, six to 750 jobs that will go unfilled uh, this holiday season. So- What's that gonna mean for the customers? customers? What's, what's gonna that? Mean, what's gonna mean, what's that gonna mean for the customers? <sighs> well, uh, you know, every year, it seems like every year, you know, just because of the market we're in, um, you know, there's a, a certain uh, lack of, of population within a five mile radius of the mall where a lot of your employees come from, particularly a lot of your part-time employees. So it's always been a little bit of a struggle during the holiday season and stores have managed to uh, kind of work their way through it. Uh, it's gonna to be tough, you know, part-time employees are gonna be asked to work more hours. Uh, Full-time employees are gonna be asked or required to work some overtime. 
uh, you know, it's such a critical time of year uh, for us and for the retailers that they're going to need to make it work, but it's not going to be without some pain. Do you think your location being uh, in, in an outer ring suburb is hurting because there's not as many people in that five mile radius? Yeah. You know, when you look at our, uh, our profile, uh, the quantitative information for the mall is fantastic. You know, household income, uh, education, you know, some of the, 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 the critical quantitative things, but where we are the weakest is within a five mile radius in this market. We've got about 70,000 people within a five mile radius. Uh, Grease Ridge Mall uh, has about 200,000. Uh, Marketplace has about 175, 180,000. So, uh, you know, when you look at business trends, you know, that's why our Monday through Thursday traffic tends to be lighter than the other malls, but because we're more of a destination center, the Friday night, Saturday, Sunday is when we make it all back up. And that's when the stores need to be, uh, you know, as, as uh, uh, prepared as possible. So, so yeah, you know, they, that population number uh, is light for our market and for our center. Um, it's made up obviously on the weekends, but, but that does hurt the, uh, the ability to track particularly some of those part-time employees that you need. Right. Any other comments on the hiring and recruiting? We know, Ed, you have so many people open. Go ahead, Denise. I, I just would say from my perspective, you know, this, this is a, the time of what they're calling the great reassessment where um, professionals are often really deciding whether they're going to stay in the, t the role they're in or whether they're going to take another role someplace else. And some of them are actually resigning without a role to go to because they are just to the point where they wanna change. And that will then result in what they're calling the resume, resume tsunami to companies that really tout what their values consist of. And those values related back to community, to sustainability and things along those lines. And so those companies are gonna be flooded with applicants. And yet what, what needs to happen is companies need to um, really start doing things called stay interviews where they're actually finding out what is good about the, the place that they um, work at and why they stay and what keeps them motivated and build on that so that they don't end up losing key talent to this resume tsunami. It's a, it's a really interesting time for HR professionals, recruiters, et cetera. But from a recruiting and hiring perspective, the ability to conduct all of this work um, across you know, the platforms such as this has really been a boost because for students, they haven't had to travel to recruiting fairs. Um, for you know, um, people who may not have transportation, they too can just log into a portal and attend several different career fairs instead of having to physically get themselves someplace. So it has helped a lot for those people who may not have an equal opportunity to transportation. Ed, your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, again, I don't know if there's a whole lot that I can add. I, I think, you know, um, uh, just echoing Tom's comment, uh, it's uh, it's a buyer's market. I think, you know, especially for the the students that are um, are watching uh, this. I think um, being clear about what you're looking for, the kind of organization you're looking for. I remember, you know, when I was coming out of coming out of Geneseo, my hope was, you know, that somebody, anybody, would take me. And um, you know, I think the uh, uh, the, the power structure has shifted a little bit where all of you can now really be quite discerning about the kind of organization you want to work for, the work that you want to do. Um, you know, I think there's, uh, uh, there's greater geographic flexibility probably than ever before. I also know that um, many of, uh, of the students um, would really value um, the opportunity to be in an office and to, to be mentored by and, and learn from others. So, uh, you know, that's going to be a, a consideration, but probably unlike any time in my um, nearly 35 year career, I would say that it's a, uh, it's a candidate's market um, these days. So don't, uh, don't, 
don't take that for granted, still put in the work and, and you know, yeah, follow the advice that others have given, but, you know, recognize that uh, you really should have, uh, have lots of options available to you. Continuing on with what Denise was talking about is people leaving for reasons, value reasons more than anything else. Um, I've heard this thing called a domino effect or turnover contagion, that if you have a strong person who leaves, a lot of other people just pick up and follow them. Any thoughts on that? You know, that is a phenomenon, but I, I do know that what's even worse is the survivor guilt when somebody good leaves and you are left kind of taking over their work. Um, uh -huh. And also, you know, trying to um, overcome the fact that they have left and why did they leave if they're if it's not known to you and so forth. So there's that to contend with because it can really cause a downturn, downturn in morale when strong people leave. Um, so that's something that employers need to be aware of. But yes, you're right. If if someone who is like the leader of the pack, so to speak, uh, does it decamp to another company, oftentimes others will follow and, and usually in short, you know, um, sequence after they do. Tom, does that scare you? It, it does. But what I'd say, it, it's unlike anything we've ever seen before. Historically, when we saw people left, leave, they were leaving for a very specific role that was usually right. substantially similar and at a competitor. And that always hurt. That was not something you ever wanted to deal with. But to Denise's point, when people are leaving now, they're leaving for very different reasons to, you know, a point was made earlier. I've had people leaving without having anything lined up. And then I've always been a, a safety guy. I always want to make sure I have you know enough in the bank. So if I lose my job, I can pay for my living for a couple of years. Like I was always someone who was very yeah. budget aware. And I guess that's why my calling is an accountant, but to have people make these decisions, it's very different than anything we've ever seen before. And it's usually things that they're passionate about. We had one of our, our folks who's an exceptional young accountant decide he wanted to be a nightclub promoter. And I just couldn't stop, you know, kind of scratching my head on that one. I'm, I'm sure it's awesome. But in the middle of the pandemic, that's the direction we're going. And he was absolutely sure that that was what he wanted to do. So what it's done is it's changed the dynamic because the conversations and the advice you could historically give people has kind of gone out the window and you're having to recreate the, the the dialogue and really listen, which was something you always had to do, but listen and, and synthesize and understand why people are making the decisions. Um, and no two are the same, which is which is interesting, but folks are very passionate about where they're going. And I think that that is a good thing. Never like to see anybody leave, but if you leave, you want them to be going to something they're going to love. Do you think this trend is just going to continue? For a couple of years, yeah. You know, and we're also seeing that it's two and a half times easier to um, get a promotion and higher salary by actually leaving the company you work for and going elsewhere. That raises are not um, being given at, at a, a pace that really is the expectation of the employees. And so they can go someplace else and get the money they're looking for, as well as the advancement opportunities. Yeah, we're build, building on that. Building on that thought, Denise, we actually went through um, a company-wide salary assessment mid-year because of how competitive the market was getting and just to make sure that we were paying our employees fairly. And to your point, not just you know the newer employees we had just recruited in the last 12 months, but to make sure that the folks who'd been with us, you don't want to lose people. <laughs> you know, you're, great, you're great folks who've been there for three and seven and five years. Um, you want to make sure that they're still on par so they can't just go somewhere and get, you know, a 15% raise or something crazy like that. Um, so that was a worthwhile activity for us. And how I do think, you deal with that? Go ahead. I was just gonna, yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think that's the main point. Um, it's way cheaper to keep the people you have than to try to go into the market and find new people to replace them on a, on a whole, you know, for a whole host of reasons, the learning curve into your culture and your way of doing things. Um, as well as, you know, uh, paying what you pay. But we, we also do sort of, uh, you know, proactive um, assessments and, and reviews. I think we've probably made, you know, more salary adjustments this year um, off cycle, so to speak, um, you know, probably to the tune of, you know, north of $20 million this past year, um, because we, you know, we firmly believe that staying competitive um, 
proactively is is going to be cheaper for us in the long run. And the pay piece of it is a part of it. I think continuing to reinforce what we stand for as a company, how our values uh, line up to, I think, the, va the values that many, many people are seeking. I've been, I'm going to shamelessly plug here, I've been doing a 10-week uh, series on LinkedIn on the 10 reasons why people should choose uh, rich products um, to, to work. And that's as much a message to people that are working for us today as it is people that we hope to recruit into the future. And, you know, n none of the 10 reasons are because we pay really, really well. Um, it, it's all about, you know, what we stand for as a company and the colleagues that you work with and, and so forth. All of that does matter if the pay piece of it's right. How have you had to change it? I mean, you've been in HR for a while. How have you got your, have, how have you and your role um, been able to, how have you had a change? Yeah, it's uh, it's a good question. I, I know Mary Ellen mentioned at the beginning of this call, you know, everybody's got to be committed to lifelong learning. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's a hundred percent true. Um, I, I actually restructured the entire um, organization that we used to call human resources about a year ago um, to what we now call the associate experience network. And I turned all of the attention of our, our team toward associates. And we've identified uh, as, as many would do with you know, customers, for example, what are the reasons you buy from us? What are the reasons you like doing business with us? And we asked those questions of our associates like, you know, the, the stay interview um, uh, that was suggested earlier. And we mapped out the nine um, critical points in, in people's careers from the time they join Excellent. to the wow. time that they leave. And we really are focused on delivering exceptional experiences for our associates against those, you know, what we call moments that matter. So, so employees are no longer a commodity. They're an asset. Yeah, we, we've always called employees our associates. And, um, you know, I think I, I'm blessed to work in a company that I think has always uh, really valued our associates, but um, we've, we're, we're being much more explicit about that. And we're learning a lot more by, uh, you know, by intentionally listening, um, not just listening in general terms, but listening to what do you value most about being here? Where are we delivering? Uh, where are we coming up short against your expectations? And, uh, and really challenging ourselves to think about how we you know, we deliver what, what they need most from us. We have a uh, John has a question. John, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Thanks, Bob. I was, I, I started to get to the Did point you? where I was typing. I was starting to type my question. Oh, no, go <laughs> ahead. Chris, I'm going to ask <laughs> you to ask your question so, too. So, so I, I, you know, I just, I kind of want to be a little careful on the way this is sounding. So, um, so totally agree in a relative measure, it's always better and cheaper to retain employees unless, right? So McKellar is just a, you know, it's a great example, right? Size of the company, what have you. So you do a mid-year review. What if that becomes quarterly or weekly, right? At, at some point, you know, people have to realize that, that companies don't have infinite resources to just keep raising pay of employees. Otherwise the company will not exist. So you know, we're at this very unique time and, you know, people are driving the bus and, you know, let's face it, there are many situations where people have been with companies 10, 15 years and they never had appropriate kind of compensation review and leaving was the only way to get it. But relative to the audience I see on this call, I don't want them walking into the workforce thinking that, you know, every six months they can go to their employer and be like, yeah, I'm not happy. I, I want to raise. Guess what? They're going to say, good luck. So just let's keep things in context as we're having this conversation. I just want to make sure that for the, the audience, um, it is a unique time. And I totally agree with that. I think, Ed, your comment on don't take it for granted is really important. And it ties to McKellar's lesson of be prepared, have the cover letter stand out in all the right ways. So let's just make sure we stay focused on, you know, kind of what we're trying to produce why we're kind of so proud of working with all these students, but you know, l let's make sure we're realistic in what and how they're going to approach this. I think the good news in what we've been hearing is that money isn't going to necessarily be the most deciding Absolutely. factor, and I think that's a takeaway. And it rarely is. 
Yeah, and it rarely is. Yeah, good learning skills. Chris, you have a question. Sure, thanks, Bob. You know, a lot of people are uh, in workplaces now where some of their teammates are 100% remote, never in the office. And I'm just curious if anyone has any experience, any tips that they can share from that experience about the kind of ways that you've already discussed building a strong culture, um, but doing it when part of the people are never physically in the room. So I can say, you know, kind of two different things we've done. One is around being effective around the communication and being creative in our communication. So it's the awareness factor, making sure that everyone is aware of culturally what our expectations are. And we're doing, instead of the big, long emails that people are really tired of reading, little videos, little snippets, little audio clips. So things to get the information there in, in a more creative way. But the other is recognition. We have a, an encore program. Anybody can put anybody up for the Encore program. It ranges from a thank you up to a monetary award that's, you know, a fairly decent amount. But it's a way to have people recognize others in the moment for something that was done, either a job well done or a, a, a behavior that others should, you know, look to emulate. So it, it's a way to you know, celebrate and recognize people. And that's certainly something that, that's helped us kind of drive our culture. You know, I would just add, uh, if I could, that um, one one truth, uh, no matter what the uh, what the environment that we're working in is, uh, associates form their opinions about their company and the work that they do, primarily from the, the person who leads them. So we've invested a lot of time in training our managers on um, leading remote teams and, and leading hybrid teams and making sure that uh, they attend to the culture of the team, that they continue to be inclusive um, and making sure that they're hearing from, from everyone, whether they're in the room, um, you know, in person or, or virtually. Um, and, you know, and I just have to say the technology has, you know, has really made that a lot easier, you know, two years ago just two years ago, uh, people would uh, do a conference call where you would not see the person on the other end on video. Mm -hmm. And very often the people in the room would just carry on and forget that there were people that were listening in and the quality of the audio and, you know, all, all kinds of things just made it much more difficult. I think having the combination of video and audio keeps people more engaged and uh, our leaders uh, understand their responsibility of you know, sort of holding that all together um, without, you know, without judgment. I think one of our big concerns was uh, our associates feeling like I've got to be in the room. I've got to physically be there if my manager's there or my manager will think less of me. And so, you know, that's, that's been an important part to reinforce both to our associates and managers. Thank you. What I'd like to do now is just uh, have our panelists go around and give one or two words of advice uh, to our students out here. And then uh, for those of you that have been part of something like this with me before, you know I'm going to go around and ask you for one word. Uh, one word that hits you, that stays with you, or a learning point. And everybody's going to have to come up with one. So start thinking about it. And uh, once we have the final comments, I'd like everybody to unmute. And we are just going to go through the one word takeaway that everybody has. So uh, why don't we uh, start uh, with Michaela? What, what advice would you have to these uh, wonderful students here? Uh, uh, keep an open mind um, and be empathetic. Great, Mike. I got on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, you know what? Uh, you know when I graduated, it was a, it called a management science degree. I'm not sure what it's called right now. I think the pros and cons to that are, you know, from a positive standpoint, it, it opens up a you know a ton of opportunities. You know, in, in terms of the direction you can go. On the negative side, it it doesn't really narrow down your options. So I think you need to uh, to be very open. Uh, on the opportunities that are out there. Um, personally, I did not even know this position really existed uh, that I'm in right now until I kind of came across it. So I think, uh, you know, just again, open mind and uh, um, explore all your options. Denise. 
you know, people typically will only respond to a job posting if they feel they meet all the requirements. Be bold, be brave, and apply, even if you don't meet 100% of those qualifications. You'd be surprised in this crazy market that you may well get an interview. Great. John, you might as well join in here, too. I actually think Denise's was just fantastic. My, my word would be tools. It's just in the world we're living in, being able to understand them, use them, appreciate them, um, and, and leverage them. Um, you know, no matter what age you are, I think reality is the focus of the, 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 you folks that are still at, at Geneseo are probably, you know, much better at it than ma many of the rest of us. Um, but the reality is it never changes. I mean, I remember, you know, using WYSIWYG and DOSC and running, ma ma oh running macros to import spreadsheets. And that served me my entire career because I always kept up with it. Um, so, you know, you, you guys are just got a huge head start um, and the tools are just going to get better. I'm, I'm advising a company right now that is uh, developing an app called Brilliant Buttons so that literally everybody can get a coach. It used to be that, you know, the top 5% of your senior executives would get this expensive person to teach you kind of how to be a better executive. This guy's been doing it for 30 years and he wants everybody to be able to have a coach like that. And it's all through technology. It's all a lot of great advice. So it's a tough act to follow. I would say uh, to, to, uh, to add on to that would be maintain a sense of intellectual curiosity in everything you're doing. Always be a student of every uh, situation. Be a student of yourself and make sure that you're being the authentic you in all of your interactions. That'll, that'll make you happy long term. Okay, Ed. Yeah, I, so much uh, good advice that, that's gone out. Let me let me try it this way so I'm not repetitive. Um, one of my favorite expressions, uh, no wind favors he who has no destined port pretty heady, but know what you want, create a plan, be prepared, and go after it. Excellent. Thank you. So now everybody unmute. Everybody unmute. And I'm going to go around real quick, and I want one word. Okay. Tyler. Uh, opportunity. Julia. Open-minded. Open okay. Oh, same word. Tim. Uh, mindset. Florence. Motivation. Chris. This is just students. No, no, everybody. Oh, everybody. intentional. You did, good. Tommy. Open mind. Dominic. Commitment. Drew. Adaptability. Brendan. Confidence. Noah. Ambition. Christian. Driven. Okay. Uh, let's see. We got it. When they're, uh, Jake. Preparation. Brody. Leadership. Sierra. Nicholas. Leadership. James. Preparation. Emerson. Lexi. Spencer. Determination. Terminate, determination? Okay. Determination. Okay, Caleb. Redu. Uh, intentional. Max. Uh, perseverance. Sydney. Flexible. Scott. Bold. Bold. Janae. Jay. Confidence. Christian. Confidence. Ryan. Hey. Jeff. Mindful. Rachel, Julia, Caleb, Anthony. Empathy. Good. Jalen. Discipline. Good. Um, Claire. Dedication. Stefan. My son. Claire. Alexis. Motivation. Great. Griffin. Options. Options. Okay, Rob and Chris, no relation. <laughs> uh, people, relationships. Chris? Del 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 Delio? Ashley? Aaron? Aaron? Ah. Determination. 
I mean, opportunities. Amanda. Empathy. Ryan. Josh. Alexis. Rachel. Mark. Jack. Confidence. Confidence. Good. Jack. Motivation. Good. Alexandra. Ambition. Tehran. Jack. Opportunity. Jack. Mindful again. Olivia. Abigail. Mohammed. Sabine. Chin. Good. Ryan. Commitment. Okay. Christian was on. He, he has a technical difficulty. Uh, Josh. Mark. Dylan. Confidence. Good. Jack. Olivia. Jocelyn. Um, innovation. Sorry, I'm struggling with this link. <laughs> James. Ambition. Great. Did we miss anybody? Mary Ellen. I didn't get you and Amanda. And Mary. I was gonna I was gonna say disruptive innovation. Mm. Mary Cannon. Gratitude. Amanda. You did get me, Bob, but empathy. Empathy. <laughs> okay. I like the word intentional. Um, I learned a very uh, a lot tonight. So uh, one, I want to, on behalf of all of our students here, uh, I, I'd like to thank Denise, uh, Mike, John, Tom, Michaela, uh, Ed, um, and Dean Zuckerman for being here. Um, hopefully we, I, I learned a lot. Hopefully you did too. Um, I was very, very, as a closing word, I, I was very, very encouraged and hopeful from the discussion that things are changing and we're, we're going back to working because of a value of what's important to us and satisfaction is going to be everything. So with that, I, I thank everybody, wish everybody a pleasant evening, and we'll see you in New York City in March for our New York City trip for those that are in New York. See you. Have a good night.